Somebody asked me, you know, in the interview, I said, what, what does an entrepreneur really need? So I said, they only need two things, common sense and a sense of urgency. That's it. And they asked me, who, the, who should we learn this stuff for? And my answer was, from your mom. Because she's probably done more management than your MBA professor. You know. Because she's got a budget, she's got all these kids running around, hard to manage. All of this thing has to be done every day, seven days a week. Now that's work. That's hard work. That's learning on the job. No matter where somebody stands on global warming or that whole issue, pollution is a problem. I don't care who you are or what your scientific uh, belief system is. We know that that's bad. We need to get rid of it. Is there a way to get totally clean energy that's sort of bullseye of all answers with no pollution and unlimited energy. So our first question was, where's the energy? And there's only one answer, and that's right here. A few miles underneath us is unlimited power, unlimited energy. You know, a few miles down, the deeper you go, the hotter it gets. You take that energy and you bring it up. Unlimited, pollution-free. Is there a way to bring up just the energy, just the heat? You can't use copper wire because it'll melt. So we found this material called graphene. Graphene is a substance that is really made out of graphite, which is like pencil lead. Right? And what they discovered was that if they take one molecule layer at a time off this graphite, that's called graphene. Okay, And it has incredible properties. It's 100 times better conductor than copper. It's lighter than air, stronger than steel. It transfers heat really efficiently. If you put 100 degrees here, you get 100 on the other side instantly, and the middle is completely cool. So the heat that you put in gets all the way there. Whether you go 10 feet or you go miles, you could bring up unlimited energy from deep underground to the surface, pollution-free. And so I approached the graphene guys and I said, could you make me a string? And they looked at me like, why would we make a string? You know, I said, look, a string is the most rudimentary technology, right? If you have a string of something, you can make cloth, you can make walls, you can make rope, you can make a cable. So if you make me a string, I'll put those strings together and make a cable. Then I'll put the cable underneath the ground. And that cable will bring up the heat. And so at first they were a little wary because it seemed too simple. They have already made the first set of ropes for us, the short ones. They've tested it and found it to work perfectly fine. We're using that and working at stage two in Michigan. Stage two has a platform we are building where we'll test everything out and then that product will be commercially manufactured and propagated from Singapore. This would be the greatest invention maybe ever because if you can get unlimited energy from underneath the earth, pollution free, that's everything, that's everything. You have no pollution, you have no fossil fuel issues, you have no um, you know, CO2 coming out, uh, greenhouse gases, you know, none of that. All of that is gone. Here's the answer. Yet no money, no research, no resources are being put to this. So this is a sort of a, a teaser to say, look guys, in your country you want energy security? Do this. You have unlimited energy without having to import anything. Now some countries are not going to like this very much because those who export, you know, fossil fuels are going to be pretty upset with me. Um, but I've kind of transferred all this technology, all of our thoughts to Singapore so that there's a, there's a, a place that's, that's neutral that is then going to give it to the rest of the world. And so this is to encourage people to say, look, if you want energy security, 
put resources in this. Energy is the great equalizer. If energy was plentiful, the poor wouldn't be poor. Our concern here isn't to make people rich. Our concern is, can we get them to make a livelihood? Can we get them to be healthy? Can we get them clean water? If you can get it to that level for the people that don't have it, that's an enormous benefit. Wall Street fellows are so enamored of companies that spend 5% of their sales on research versus 3%. What, is this brains by the pound? You know, it, it, it's, it's not about the money. Good stuff doesn't come from money. And history tells us that, and we still chase it. Mobs of PhDs do not come up with great inventions. It's a couple of guys in a garage that have proven that that's not true. And it's usually a couple of people. Throughout history, it's only been a couple of people have come out with the greatest of stuff. And yet we insist that if we have a thousand PhDs instead of 500, we're going to do it better. It makes no sense. The drought has left its mark here. Some communities could soon run out of water entirely. This is what the Sierra looked like a year ago. But this winter, what a difference. The state now in extreme drought. Nature's always smarter than we are. Let's say you come up with an invention that makes clean water out of all this huge amounts of salt water that the world has. Water everywhere, not a drop to drink. So we've got all this water, but we can't use it. Now there's a lot of places around the world, whether it's India, Africa, China, everywhere, there's a shortage of water. And one of the reasons we went after water is because it is totally fundamental to human life. All right, spray bars are holding, starting to make distillate, cool. Where we are right now is the rain project. This equipment, what it does, it turns seawater or any dirty water into fresh water. Well, one of the reasons why we got involved in the RAIN project is we saw a lot of lacking technologies in the market to generate what we call high quality water, which can be used for agriculture, drinking, and industrial applications. But more importantly, it does not require any operational support. All right, start spinning other parts. The reason we called it the RAIN project basically mimics nature. It heats water. You have water vapor. And then you take that moisture into a different compartment and then you distill it. The steam or vapor. So it takes energy to heat the water and then the energy is released when you turn it back to water. So we take that energy and recycle it back to heating the water again. This little bitty machine here can do a thousand gallons an hour. Some of the great things about it compared to what the technology is today is one, it has no parts that go, are consumables. No screens or no membranes that go bad. And it can be made to make distilled water or any level of clean water. Whereas current technology will only take seawater and turn it into drinking water, but it will not turn it into water that can be used for agriculture. It still has too much salt. This was our, our, our prototype version from six months ago. We learned off this version. We added some new ideas and concepts. And we built to what we believe is our next version to go into the field for commercial use. Billy came out of automotive. So everything is made with that discipline in mind. That you're going to build a plant, and then you're going to have pop hundreds of these out every day. As we call it, we can cookie cutter it. So we can stamp out thousands upon thousands of them. The world's requirements are staggering. So you need to be able to build thousands of these, you know, instead of one plant that takes 15 years to build. We don't have the time for that. We're able to take, you know, seawater, undrinkable, unusable for anything, and turn it into, into complete drinking water, literally in a, in a matter of minutes. And the beauty is, it's a very self-contained system. 
You don't need a lot of infrastructure to do it. If you move something in in a modular basis, you need the hoses to hook up for the water, a couple of tanks to collect the water, and electricity to run it. So it's very easy um, and, and modular system to be able to put in anywhere in the world. And when you're done, you have lovely, fresh, clean water. It's warm enough to make tea right now, but Good, fresh, ready to go. Great. How is it? It's good. It's good distilled water. You know, it's it's uh, this this water right here is probably at a level um, almost a pharmaceutical grade water. Wow. And uh, that's one of the other beauties is we can raise or lower what you know how what the level we want to. But this is very 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 pure water right now. From fresh clean water comes food, comes livelihood for farmers comes health. This is the first time exceptional drought has ever been declared in California. These before and after pictures show where water levels should be and where they are today. Whether you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter. If you don't have water, you have to move or die. That's going to happen across the world. We have to work on water. There's no choice. So in California, I mean, Right now they're not looking at it, nobody wants to say it, but if you don't get water, if you don't solve this problem, California becomes a desert. Now we're looking at it and saying, instead of one big desalination piece of equipment, you have a farm of these. It can either be put on the shore next to the ocean, or you create this barge which has a lot of units on it. So a barge can maybe produce somewhere between 15 and 20 million gallons a day. Right? And why, the question would be, why, why on a barge? Well, the simple answer is that's where the water is. You know, so let's say you put it a couple miles offshore, you have this barge which has a short height because the equipment is underneath. And the reason it's underneath uh, is because the water will just flow into it. And so you don't have to pump water in. So it flows in, doesn't kill the wildlife. You can then pipe the fresh water, either on floating pipes uh, to the land, or you can put it in tankers and, and bring it to land. So we're thinking of things like, if you, if you had 100 or 200 barges, let's say in, off Southern California's coast, you could, all the shortfall of Southern California would be covered. And the advantage of that is that if people at that point say, well, you know, we don't like you being there. And then you say, okay, see ya, we'll go to the next place. So there's some, the answers have to be uh, lower in energy, then it needs to be, be able to be made in massive scale, and then it also has to be, go past political issues. All of those are real problems. And so this project, what it does is say, okay, we, with this, if you have thousands of barges, throughout the world, we can address the, the needs of, you know, ridiculous amounts of people. And in the end, we're going to have to do that in order to, to, to take care of the seven, eight, nine billion people that are going to end up on Earth. So, so that's, that's a project that's for us, is a big deal. We have uh, what's called the Prime Directive, which is if any of you have ever seen Star Trek, there's a Prime Directive. And the Prime Directive in our company is no aggravation. Okay. Nobody gets to give us aggravation. Whether it's customers, vendors, employees. If you aggravate, you got to go. It's that simple. Because, and it's really business. Because usually it's the 1%. You know, some customer that's got 1% of your business, and he's driving you nuts. And he's taking up 80% of your head. How is that business? So, aggravation is the largest cost in business. My work is my hobby. I don't really do work because I have to. I actually like it. It's my basketball and football. So much fun. I just tried four different new flavors of five hour. For your smile? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can go from one, you know, all of a sudden doing charity to do, doing technical to doing five hour flavor. I have to switch from company to company within minutes. <laughs> I don't think he would be Manoj if he wasn't doing a lot of things at, a, at one time. It's how he thrives. 
I want a Jetson suitcase. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, good luck with that. We could do that. We could do that. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Which way? I always get lost here. Too many companies. I forgot my keys. <sighs> so annoying. And then the oh, dance. Look at that. Oh, fancy. Yeah. And we have oh, to tell wow. you a j joke about Capella, but we'll let you know. This is specially for you. Oh, God. <laughs> this is just to annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> this is to give me aggravation. <laughs> Let me give you a quick 50 cent tour and then... Okay, yeah. So this is uh, about three times the size we had. Okay. The cutting edge of medical science today is changed from what they've been doing for the last 50 years. For the last 50 years, what they've been doing is saying, okay, here's a disease, let's kill it. You know, let's kill something. And now... What they're looking at is, well, no, 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 that's really not the answer. The answer is what is known as immunotherapy. In other words, the, in cancer right now, the biggest thing that everybody's working on is immunotherapy. What the ultimate goal is, is to make somebody stronger internally. And so that disease doesn't happen or that the disease becomes so small because it's getting attacked by the immune system. What we found for that is... One of the great products that have been in, that's been invented, you know, decades ago. So when it was invented, it wasn't the right time for it. Now, when people are looking at immunotherapy as the big thing, this is probably the biggest weapon in its arsenal. Uh, the same yeah, it is. Foam? Same memory foam. Yeah. yeah. Only the color is uh, different. It's, uh, Slightly, like, yeah. yeah. And everything else is the same. Right here, we're working on the ECP project called RENEW. And the ECP project stands for External Counter Pulsation. The idea is the ECP squeezes blood from the legs back into the core body and assists the heart when the heart's resting. While the heart is resting, this is pumping. While the heart is pumping, this is resting. They go back and forth, so it acts almost like an auxiliary heart. The arteries become wider, which lets blood pass more easily. The effects happen through the entire body. The evidence is overwhelming that it makes people healthier. Right. Tighten that, then tighten that. Right, there you go. Was that easier? Yes. Yeah. When I first looked at it, I said, are you guys kidding? I mean, is this Monty Python? Yeah, this one and this one. There's an old movie called uh, Life of Brian, uh, people are volunteering for crucifixion. If somebody asked me, okay, you've got heart problems, which would you like, surgery or not surgery? Well, first, I'd like to try the non-surgery, guys. I mean, I don't have to be a genius to figure that part out. Even if it doesn't work as well, you know, you would still want to say, I want to go with the non-surgical approach. We looked at that and we thought, okay, this is pretty obvious. And then we realized that there were so many things it was doing. And amazingly, the science guys, over the years, there were 300 published peer-reviewed studies on the benefits of this. And yet, it never made it into the mainstream. Well, when first somebody came to me with it, I said, look, I, you know, there's so much logic here. I'm just going to buy one. So there were a couple of guys that were making it. Uh, now, because nobody really bought many of these, it was a big clunker. It took up half the room, and it was 220, created heat. It was terrible. Right? I said, oh, it doesn't matter. I'm going to buy it. So we have one here all folded up. You put it together? So we will go and, and pop That's it That's a good idea. Right so. Okay. I should time this. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we changed the whole thing, so made it really simple, small, made a bunch of modifications to it. We've talked to some of the top guys in the world in terms of both cardiologists as well as medical research guys, and they're all, of course this is great. However, we asked some people that are not at the top of the field, and they said, no, 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 this is for old people that can't have surgery. Surgery is way better. And it's not because they're being dishonest. It's because how everybody's been trained. It's legacy. 
It's how I was taught. Put the hoses on and it's ready to run. Okay. Well, that was about a, less than a minute. <laughs> okay. So actually, this can be now put in a corner somewhere or taken in a truck or put it van in a closet, or something. put it in a corner, you can store it away okay. or. Very cool. You know, it can go room to room for people. You right. know it. Right. You know, in a doctor's it, office or something. And it plugs into a normal 110 volt plug. What it does is it enhances circulation. Nature has already made this pump called the heart, and it's pumping to keep everything going. You know, getting oxygen and nutrients, hauling of the waste. Then what happens over time is the pump gets old. The pump gets old, doesn't quite do the job. All of a sudden, you've got all kinds of things happening from, you know, from your toes to your hair. You know, skin's wrinkling, arthritis. All of these things happen. Where they come from? Really, where they came from is that you got weaker. Your system got weaker. That's when you let all of this junk in. Think about it. If you leave waste, if you leave trash all over the body, if you leave trash in your head, and then you get a disease in your head, and you're thinking, well, how, how did I get disease? Well, you left trash in your head, right? It's where trash happens, it rots, turns to poison, and then all of a sudden you have diseases. If you haul away the trash, the chances of being better, being healthier, and not having those diseases come in are much higher. So what this does is enhances circulation. And again, back to what we do here at stage two, it's just nature with a twist. We go for simple, which is, if you're healthier, if you're better, if you're stronger, then there's less disease. I got this from Sir David Lane, and I was thinking all about nutrients and oxygen. And he pointed out, no, 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 it hauls away the waste. And he put it so well, which was, the idea is not to treat illness, it's to treat wellness. It's to make wellness better. That's how you treat illness. That was, that was so smart. David Lane is uh, regarded as one of the foremost scientists and experts in the area of cancer and oncology. He's actually been knighted by the Queen. He's a brilliant person. Uh, when you get to talk to him, you'll realize how fast he can understand the things we are doing. And he sees tremendous benefits for ECP in healthcare. So his point is, if you can delay ailments, that's healthcare. We tend to think of ourselves as being well or being ill, but the reality is it's a continuum. And what we should be aiming for is great wellness and no illness. I think what we tend to do is think we're well until we're ill, and, and that's the wrong way around. We need to be thinking about maintaining health as a much more proactive process. Everybody wants a shortcut, so maybe I take this vitamin and I'll be better, or maybe I'll do this, I'll be better. But what we need to do is think about fundamentals. So what is the fundamental? The fundamental is the blood, the circulation. That's what your heart's doing, that's what's taking nutrients around your body, that's what's critical for eliminating waste products. So clearly, poor circulation is the basis of a, of a lot of illness. So it's clear to me, you know, that anything that can help people to, uh, to improve their health is very, very important. So ECP is an example of that. Everybody says, well, you know, how can something so simple work? How can just pumping your circulation a bit help? But the question is, ask the question, does it work? If it does work, then it's very valuable. And I think this is where, you know, you have to go outside the system. I mean, the current system educates people to behave in a certain way. You know, you, you, you get ill, you go to the doctor, the doctor's a godlike figure, the doctor's going to save you, you know, that's how it works. And, and instead of thinking, oh, I'm part of this process, you know, I can't be passive, I should be active. And I think it's that shift in thinking to think about new ways of doing things. Of course, it doesn't solve every disease there is, but it is one of the greatest things that we found. This is the answer for the poor. Of course, you know, whether you're poor or rich, you're still only a human being. Health is something that's across the board, whether you're rich or poor. When we looked at that for, for, for the poor, we said, okay, well, this, this is across all human uh, needs. And if you can do this, how many things does it affect? Is it wide enough? Oh, yes. Yeah. Because now you made it for whatever. So, yeah, we still did it for 95th yeah, percentile. Yeah. It's so. still... 
Yeah. So if I gain another 20 pounds, <laughs> I'm still okay. The interesting part is that once you try it a couple of times, you're like, okay, okay, I need that. You just feel better. You are better and you feel better. Uh, I mean, I've been on it for a couple, three years now. And my son says, you know, in 30 years, I'll be 50 and you'll be 40. <laughs> so so the, the effects have been remarkable. And so I said, okay, if I'm going to use it, then I need to get that benefit out to everyone. And uh, we're going to impact health in a way that no medicine can do it. We have our own jargon to some extent. Like, for example, somebody comes to me, the project or a product that we're going to go sell or, or some, some project, I ask them, is it slam dunk? You know, and, and no, it's really good. I said, no, no, is it slam dunk? So, but, but it really, it's a good product. And what it does is it totally clarifies their mind that, oh no, it's not slam dunk. Then, then I say, well, why are we gonna do it? When we first went out to do philanthropy in a, in a big scale, so we started giving money all over the place and helping other people to do their work. As time goes on, you learn stuff. And then you realize, if you help a little bit, it's a good thing, but at my scale, you're just throwing sand in the ocean. You know, it just disappears every time you do something. In India, for example, we're building two hospitals in places where they just don't have any medical facilities. So we started this foundation called the Hunts Foundation. We invent stuff here, and then the Hunts Foundation is gonna be the one to distribute all of these things which are non-existent there. So as it grows, your responsibility grows, but also the what you affect grows. There's an old story from Indian scriptures about a blind man heading towards a well. There's a guy who's watching. If the blind man falls into the well, who gets the blame? Is it the blind man? Or is it the guy who's watching? Our approach to philanthropy, there has to be meaning I mean, the question for us was this. How can we make a sizable difference to alleviate human suffering? Who's got the technology for this? Who can make this happen? Manoj is driven by the fact that work is never done. What it shows is that a single person with a small team can actually affect close to five million people. So it doesn't take much to then go and say, how do I help the remaining 500 million? If you're doing really great things that have purpose, you feel great. And so we found a whole bunch of things that we can do ourselves that will make uh, a difference for, you know, for 100 years. The more wealth you get, the bigger your duty becomes which is to help those who have less, who are suffering. The more you're given, the more you're asked. You should be more responsible for the more you're given. It's not a curse, but it's like a weight that if you're given more, more is expected from you. And it should be. It's that simple. That's it.